would have it. But no, no, we all still leave us ourselves on mute sometimes. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Minister Janae Ashley Colvin. I use she, her pronouns. I serve on the Religious Diversity and Pastoral Care Team at DePaul. And I am so excited to see all of you. So many of you tonight. Look, look at all of y'all. Look at all these names I see, all these wise, wise people in the space. Yes, we have an amazing panel. Yes, we have the incomparable Sister Helen Prejean with us, but we also have you in the room. We also have your voices in the room. We also have your thoughts in the space. So we ask that you would engage the entire night if you feel comfortable. Listen, we know it's late. It's been a Monday. Nobody loves Mondays. If you love Mondays, that's okay. We still love you. But most of us, we don't love Mondays. So we understand that some of y'all are just going to have your cameras off. That's all right. But you can still hit us up in the chat, talk to each other, engage, respond to the panelists and the questions and the conversation that you hear. We would love, love, love to see that. And if you have any questions during the conversation, please send them to me or Joanna. I don't know where she is on your screen, but she's right here on my right here on mine. <laughs> um, send those to us privately so we can push them to the panelists. Our panelists won't be in the chat the entire time. We want to be able to allow them to have the conversation and focus. So if you have a question, make sure you direct it to me or Joanna so that we can make sure the panelists see it. The end of our time in the normal setup conversation, we will have an open Q&A where you can ask your questions directly. I also want to let you know that you might have seen the little notification in the corner that says we are recording this. We want to be able to share this rich conversation with others who weren't able to be present with us at the time. We are all gathered right now. So we are recording. Um, please know that that means that anybody who is on screen or whose voice is, is out in the open will be a part of the recording. I just want everyone to know that. Um, so that if you do choose to speak, if you do choose to take yourself off camera, you will be in that recording. And don't worry about it, y'all all look so lovely. We know that y'all are amazing people. Y'all are the DePaul family. We hope that people will know you. Um, so yes, that is what I wanted to share with you all. Welcome, welcome. So let's get some practice with that lively chat. Let's see who's out there, what's happening. We're going to ask everyone at this time to put three things into the chat and we'll put that prompt in the chat for you. But if you could just simply share your name if you're a student at DePaul, share what year you are at DePaul. If you're faculty and staff joining us, share the role that you have at DePaul. If you're from outside of DePaul, from joining us from another community, just share where you're joining us from. And finally, to share one social justice issue that you're passionate about. So your name, what year you are at DePaul or what your role is, and one social justice issue that you're passionate about. This is to test to see if we all know how to use the chat so we can engage in a meaningful way this evening. So welcome to everyone. You see some students here. We see faculty and staff. We see all sorts of issues about social justice that we care deeply about. Oh, y'all like good stuff. Yes. This is great. You've got it. Mm. <clears throat> wow. Hi, Joanna's parents. <laughs> well, while those introductions continue, we're going to move on to introducing our panelists for this evening. We have some amazing, phenomenal women who are living Louise's legacy in powerful ways as the Paul student advocates. These are women who are present in our campus community and who live out their love for justice and the people that they serve every single day. And because we know how humble they are, we are going to tell you how fantastic and magnificent and wonderful they are. So I would first like to introduce why not Charles? She's a third year student studying health science with a concentration in public health. She serves as a Sankofa student leader, as well as a peer health educator in the Office of Health Promotion and Wellness. Why not embodies the call to take care of DePaul with her commitment to community and Vincentian holistic wealth, health. 
please, oh, help as well. Um, please give Why Not some love in the chat. Use your reactions in the chat to welcome Why Not to the panel. We also have the wonderful Giselle Cervantes with, this, this, with us this evening. She is a senior studying international studies. Giselle served as the former Student Government Association president, which is, <laughs> is a huge job if anyone knows about that, especially if it's during the pandemic. Um, she is a DePaul Community Service Scholar. She's part of the Vincentian Heritage Scholar cohort and is a coordinator for the DePaul Community Service Association. DePaul's commitment to student advocacy, service, and systemic change make Giselle a modern day Vincentian. So let's give some love to our dear Giselle. Amir Hattie is a second year student studying sociology and Arabic studies. She's a Vincentian service scholar and serves as the programming assistant in the office of Multicultural Student Success for the Black Cultural Center. In this role, she cultivates spaces for community support and awareness to uplift and empower those most marginalized in our own spaces. She's an advocate for educational equity and committed to systemic change in educational institutions. We are joined by one other special guest tonight who happens to share a birthday with Amira. And so it is only appropriate that Amira introduce her birthday twin. Yes, uh, April 21st is in fact a wonderful day to be born. Sorry, it's the only day that's a good day uh, taken up by us. If you're not born on April 21st, you're like second class. Sorry. Uh <laughs> Great start. Great start. <laughs> it's right after Hitler and right before Earth Day, by the way. I'd like to think of it being Earth Day part one, so... <laughs> <laughs> so I learned recently that I share a birthday with Sister Helen, who's an anti-death penalty advocate and activist, Sister Helen Prejean, who joins us tonight. Sister Helen Prejean has been, an, who has been educating people about the inhumanity of the death penalty for more than 30 years. She served as a catalyst for the Catholic Church's anti-death penalty stance and has shaped the debate around the world. She's also the author of Dead Man Walking, her book about accompany, accompanying a man on death row, which has been adapted to, into film and a graphic novel. Sister Helen's most recent book, River of Fire, is her spiritual narrative of waking up to justice. We are excited to dive right in and tap into your wisdom of experiences. Uh, ooh, sorry, my laptop glitched for a second. <laughs> We hope tonight will be a meaningful conversation building up on building on each other's wisdom. Knowing your book is about your journey of waking up to justice. Let's start there. Let's start with each of us sharing a story about how we became involved in a social justice issue we are working on right now. Sister Helen, let's start with you. You share in your book that this didn't happen overnight. So we'd love to hear a bit of your waking up story. Oh, that's for sure. Uh, how long do you want me to talk to get started? About 10 minutes? Because we want uh, as much participation, right? Am I right? Speak, yeah. guide me. I would say five to seven minutes for this first one. Oh, round. five to seven. We can do that too. Okay. Uh, this waking up thing happens because we are spiritual beings. We have souls. And souls are the part of us that awaken to the deepest reality. And first of all, we can't wake up to something if we don't already have the deep potential in us to respond to it. The reason it even triggers something in us is because there's a part of us like these little antennas reaching out. And then when we hit it, it sparks something in us. And we can call it, what did uh, uh, Louise call it, her lumieres, the moments of enlightenment. So, you know, this waking up in me is still going on. It's going on me right now. I was supposed to do a CNN thing at rooster time, 6.30 in the morning this morning. I get up, I take my shower, I get ready and the thing get, the schedule got changed. You got to deal with that when you're dealing with the media. But what they wanted to ask me about and what I want to talk about and what I'm waking up to is that there are people, some of the people on death row in some states that are choosing the firing squad over lethal injection because they've heard the stories of how you paralyze and they strap you down and they inject these drugs into you to kill you. 
and you can't respond in any kind of way, often you're even paralyzed. And so rather than go through the lethal injection thing, they are choosing a firing squad. And of course that arouses this thing in people, oh my God, look how barbaric we are. I just want to say lethal injection is barbaric and to take any conscious, imaginative human being and put them in a cell for 15, 20 years and then give them a date and take them out and kill them is cruelty. We don't have a Supreme Court yet that can look at the, those words in the Eighth Amendment, cruel and unusual punishment and recognize that the death penalty is cruelty. Their souls aren't there yet. They use a certain lens and how they're gonna interpret those words cruel. So they put it through the lens of, well, the framers of the constitution didn't think it was cruel, so neither do we. But that means they're out of touch with the suffering that has been going on and all the human beings that have been killed with the death penalty. Soul is the part of us that awakens and recognizes humanness and suffering when we see it. So I'm always waking up and I'm thinking, the firing squad in a way is just making the death penalty more honest. There have been two court cases where to, to make executions public, you believe this is justice? You believe you're doing it for the good of society? Why don't you make it public? Why do you hide it? And this whole lethal injection thing is just to try to mask it as though you're doing something you're just putting people to sleep and how humane can that be? And sometimes you hear prosecutors comparing it with, well, well, look what happened to their victim. As if our criteria for the way we respond morally as a society or the crimes that people do, those are the worst acts humanity of humanity that are done when people kill other people. How do we set our standard and how do we set it high? Well, the Vincentian, the Jesus message in us, that is part of that soul part of us that responds, that deep human compassion. Oh my God, that person is being made to suffer. That's cruel, that's harsh. And then we respond to it. And you are fortunate, you are blessed because you're with a community of people that share the same deep soul values that you have. So there's a part of you, if you can think of you like a garden, that the soil of your souls is always being tilled because you're always in the presence of each other. You're reading, you're learning, you're participating in panels like this to talk about how power happens within us. When I first awakened that the gospel of Jesus was about justice, I was 40 blooming years old. Look at you. You got a great head start. So think of all you're going to be able to do. So I kind of had to do big catch up when I woke up when by being with people in the St. Thomas housing projects with African-American people. First time in my life I was ever with African-American people as my peers. I grew up in the deep South in Baton Rouge during the Jim Crow days. And the only way I knew, knew African-Americans was as our servants. I never knew them as my neighbors, as my friends. So when I woke up that the gospel of Jesus is not just being charitable to all the people around you, that's good. And we always are going to need charity. People are going to need food. That's good. But the gospel of Jesus calls us to more than charity. Because what makes people poor? What are the systems that keep putting things in place? And this is harder to do. Because we got to use our intellectual prowess. We, gotta, we have to analyze things. And definitely we got to join with other people. Just witness what's happened with Black Lives Matter. How many years I've witnessed this when I was in the St. Thomas Housing Project. Have policemen been killing Black people? They've been doing it for a long, long time, using the whole pretense of a traffic stop and then moving from there until it escalates in the violence over and over. Black Lives Matter. People start standing up and they begin to act. And then the killing of George Floyd, which I believe are witnessing through that video, that was a young, brave girl, Darnell, Darnell Frazier, who held that iPhone. <clears throat> Even with Officer Chauvin threatening her, 
put down that thing, I'm gonna taser you. And she held up that iPhone. And we, maybe COVID helped in this sense that we were all in our homes. We weren't at work, we weren't shopping, we were there and we could attend nine minutes and 29 seconds to watch as the breath was taken out of a human being by a cruel act of an officer that misused his authority and killed a man. But it's all about having witnesses. And I'm venturing to guess that with you, that when that spark in you wakes up, hey, I need to get involved in this, it's you witness something, you see something. Sometimes that can come to you through reading. You read, when we read words, when we read a book, when our imaginations are turned on and witnessing scenes, I've been amazed at the power of Dead Man Walking. I didn't know a book could have such power because as you're reading and I'm taking you with me to the suffering of the victim's family here, oh my God, what could ever heal them? What if that happened to my sister? What if that happened to my mother? And you're there, you're in it. And then to move over to, okay, now here's what we're gonna do to the man who killed these teenage kids. We're gonna kill him. And my job as the author, as the writer, was to take you step by step in Dead Man Walking and then take you into the execution chamber and then to witness for yourself through your imagination what it means for the state to take a human being, render them defenseless and kill them. Books can do that. Papers you write can do that. A letter to the editor can, can do that. Never underestimate the power of words to unleash in us this potential that we all have to become very powerful human beings and reach out to heal and help others. The very gospel, you open it up, what is it? It's words of witnesses who lived with Jesus, saw what he did, felt his power, felt his healing, and probably the heart of the resurrection appearance you know, at first we think, ooh, he, the stone rolled back and he came flying out of the tomb and all the soldiers. Well, that's the metaphor story that's been given to us. But the interior soul experience of the apostles of the resurrection, what was it? If you had a video camera training where Jesus was buried and it's Easter morning and the sun comes up and the video camera's running, what would we actually see? But the apostles witnessed something. They experienced something of the man they had abandoned, they had betrayed. He was taken away by the Roman authorities. They all ran. Peter betrayed him and they had the rest of their lives to sit with that. I'm working with a man right now at Angola who has two life sentences. He's never gonna walk out of Angola. And he has to deal with, I don't know how he just hasn't imploded with guilt. He has to deal with when he was on drugs and when he was in a state of rage and anger, he killed two women and two children. And he has to live with that and recognize that he is the son of God, even though he'll be in prison the rest of his life, that he can live his life each day with dignity and he can love others. Only God's grace makes that possible. And if you check out Sandra Snyder's book called In Our Midst, what was the resurrection experience of the apostles after they had done this terrible thing and abandoned Jesus? What was that experience that they had? And can we have it too? or only they had it because they were the first apostles, they're the witnesses, and then they pass it on to us kind of like a secondhand faith. Like, okay, look, believe it. we we experienced Jesus resurrected. So y'all got to believe us. And then, then you can have faith too. Isn't it all religious experiences of the soul? What, what Louise called her Lumieres, it happens to us. That's the awakening. It happens to us. So I can't wait to hear from you. Can't wait to hear about these awakenings that are going on in you. And when we share it together, think about building a fire. Here's one little log. You don't have a little log burning by itself over here. That doesn't make a fire. The logs are going to go out. But you put them all together 
and you get a fire. And that's what community does. And that's what we're doing right now. And now over to you. Thank you, Sister Helen, for all of that. That that was really beautiful. That had so many gems in it. Um, <laughs> I guess like a Lumiere moment for me. I mean, speaking as like a person of color, it's not something that like you get to experience. It's something that kind of is forced upon you. It's not like I had a choice to avoid this or that I had a choice to not have this realization. It happens no matter what. And it happens violently too, in some aspects. Um, I was realizing this today um, when a friend of mine was posting this video about how teachers will scold black students for making a minor mistake, either forgetting to write down their name or forgetting like a certain detail. And just hearing how emotionally abusive the language that was being used by that teacher and just just the different just like the level of like aggression and and chastise and this is like what a teacher that teaches minors like th these are literally children and the way that it immediately took me back to when I was like nine years old and I was being yelled at by a teacher in front of the entire class because I forgot to turn in an assignment and just the humiliation, like the public humiliation that comes with that and me realizing I'm not like the other students. I will never be like the other students if this is how I get treated when I make a mistake. Um, and it, it was just like, it was like this understanding that like the classroom is not an even playing field. Like I will always have to come down on myself way harder for my mistakes than the other kids because mm -hmm. If I don't do it, someone else will, and it'll be such a worse experience because of how humiliating it is. Um, and so it's just that constant like academic anxiety of like, how, how do I <laughs> function in this space knowing that like it's not safe for me, um, which is one of the main reasons why like I, I had worked so hard in academic equity when I was in high school because it was like if if I if this isn't going to be safe for me I at least want it to be safe for the next kid um and like knowing that that's not it's not true like it won't be because how how quick are people are to change how quick are people are to confront themselves not very <laughs> um and so it was kind of just accepting that like this is this is an uphill battle and protecting myself and protecting other students is, is, is always going to be the goal, but it's, it doesn't mean that it's always going to happen. Um, so yeah, I, I will pass it on to Wynette. <laughs> uh, I think for me, um, my kind of luminaire is kind of different because I, I always grew up not knowing like the impact that I could make. And so said, and you mentioned, you know, never underestimating like what you can do, what words can do, what this can do. And I, for a long time, I think that I grew up underestimating just what impact that I can create. And I've always felt like I've been called to service and called to just like help others. And I remember one time someone telling me, why are you doing this for free? Why are you always trying to volunteer and stuff? And there was just something inside of me that was like, why would you even think that volunteering or providing service for others is a bad thing? And then, you know, for a long time, I was kind of like doing that kind of searching where I wanted to match my passions and my calling to help others. And then when I moved to the US, to a place where I not only had to adjust to living in a new country, but living in a country that was so full of the systematic problems. I'm hearing, you know, my peers talk about things that I've never experienced before in my life. Like I've, I've never grew, grew up in a situation where I was treated different from other kids based on the color of my skin, based on, on being a black person and being, like moving to America and, you know, hearing the experiences of others and seeing, you know, what others have been through, just wanting to make that different, wanting to plant that seed, like, you know, in the office of health promotion. And when we always talk about planting that seed in the community, and even if we plant that seed, we've done enough, we've provided the resources, the skills, we've given the labor to allow that seed to grow and to germinate. And for me, that is how I see my role in 
the community in any community that I go in to be able to plant the seed to give this um, information to give my time my efforts to allow that seed to grow and be fruitful and just to to plant that seed in a way that future generations wouldn't have to experience the things that they're experiencing my future generations can say there are people who look like me who have done great things there are people who came before me and put things in place have raised their voices to injustices in a way that allows me to have a better childhood to have a better you know college experience to have a better work experience and for me that i i think is one of my biggest um you know waking up stories to be able to see that you know if it's just one little thing that i do i can see that you know in the future that it will grow into something it will be something better and provide that um arena where others can see what i have done and add to it and others can see what others have done and add to it and and kind of like when we saw the um the protests like over the last year how everyone came together and built that community i think that is something that has really moved me and shaped the way that i you know interact with social justice issues Um, for me, uh, my waking up, um, I think, happened in my time at DePaul, and it was this um, process and this um, experience of being loved by people here at DePaul, um, and in a way that I had never felt um, before from people other than my family. Um, my family loves me unconditionally, and um, I thought that they were the only people that would ever love me unconditionally, and then I came to DePaul, and I got to be with people who just love very genuinely and are so vulnerable and to experience that was such a gift. And um, I, there was one time sophomore year that I was dealing with some um, really tricky mental health things and um, a staff member, Gina Leal, told me like, I will walk with you Giselle to university counseling services right now, or if you wanted to call them, you can call them and I will sit with you on the phone and we'll figure it out together. And that was a big waking up moment for me because of the way um, she stood in solidarity with me and the way I thought to myself, I want to be there for other people in the way that Gina has been for me. And I think that there's a lot of power in being vulnerable about mental health and being vulnerable about being open to community care and having like experienced community care and having had people be open about their mental health uh, with me here at DePaul, it is such a gift um, that I want to share that with others and make sure that everybody has access to that. Um, so, a, so a specific social issue that um, has been important to me is mental health access. Um, so here at DePaul, when I was student government president, I actually um, created and chaired a committee uh, called the Mental Health Committee that was looking to make mental health services at DePaul completely free of cost. Uh, because uh, DePaul has some mental health services um, that are $5 per, ser uh, per service, typically not right now because of COVID, they've been offering them for free, which is really great. Um, but last year when we saw this, we realized that $5 can still be a barrier for students, especially students that are living on their own and who are experiencing college. Uh, we all come from unique, different financial backgrounds. And so um, we as students saw that there was a need for accessible mental health services at DePaul. And uh, we came together as a committee. And now I know that the committee is still continuing to push for these mental health services to stay free after um, COVID times, because right now they're free. Um, and I just think it's a really wonderful thing to be able to experience community and be cared for. And I hope that everybody gets to feel the same way too. I was so lovely like hearing everyone's wake up story. And I think, you know, I just wanna direct this question first at, um, Sister Helen, in your book, you share at how you started your journey arguing with nuns <clears throat> that they needed to pray more instead of doing justice work. What do you say to people who say, you know, religion and spirituality should be kept separate from activism? Oh, you're on mute, sister. 
that is one of really one of the big, big, big issues of our day, the way religion is used. Religion somewhere along the line began to be more a private thing. That's between you and God, the way you pray. Uh, you want to be close to God in your life. And it got privatized. And actually the religious life that I joined was it had a heavy emphasis on we weren't quite cloistered, but in a way we were as nuns and our role was to pray for the world, even do penance for the suffering world. And we'd go out to teach, but then we'd come back. And so it was very heavy, top heavy, that what you do as a nun is you pray. So when it started breaking through to us, that justice was really important and we needed to get involved, which meant we need to get involved in politics as well. It was a struggle for me. And, but our faith leads us to action. And I just want to call attention to what President Biden just did. He undid what Trump had done before him, barring transgendered people from getting health care. Trump did that. And Biden just undid that. Where's God in this? The gospel of Jesus to unbind those that are, I mean, the, the dignity of transgendered people as human beings. And Biden's actions, if you just look, there are just so many. He's not doing everything perfectly, and of course he won't. But all I know is that the COVID-19 bill went through. So I see faith in forming politics. It, I mean, Jesus in the world, I love what Pope Francis says that God flows through us. I mean, each of the things I've heard you talk about, it's a flowing of God's energy through us. A mirror, that realization of you, yourself, as a person of color, what was happening to you and what was happening to others, or mental health, or talking about, I want to make it better for everyone. I'm, I'm here for service. So religion is not something apart. Our faith informs everything. Actually, did you ever think of what faith is? It's actually our way of seeing things is our faith. We see it. Some people just look at it and see it superficially. But faith gives us eyes to see that we can see beyond the surface and we can see to the heart of things. We have to develop that in ourselves because we live in an American culture, consumerism, out the kazoo, buy this, you're only happy when you're buying stuff, get more stuff, get this new 5G or 64G or whatever the thing is with the phones or whatever, gotta have this new thing. And we we're pervaded with that. But things of the heart and to be able to see is what faith does. And then we act. So St. John in, in his apostle, talks about do the truth. Faith helps us to see. Compassion, we are moved to, to recognize the human being suffering, and then we act. Action is power. When we don't act, when we see and we just stand aside, we can get very paralyzed, especially in this information age where we get so much information about the world. And by the time even if you turn on your iPhone in the morning and you've gone through the people dying in droves in India and families trying to get oxygen for their families. And then you look over at what's happening in Africa and Senegal. And when you look at the world, there is just so much suffering that comes in on us that we have information about it that we didn't have in other. And we can become totally paralyzed. And that's why when we're in community like this and we can share with each other as we do. Faith in us leads us to share. Faith in us helps us know that we, without community, we cannot sustain the fire of our faith very long. It's why liturgy is important. It's why praying together is important and also praying on our own. And it's why learning in theology, in religion, about what true religion is, and how it works. We have had Christianity mouthed. And when 
children were separated from their parents at the border. You had then Sessions, who was the attorney general, quote from St. Paul's letter uh, in, in, where is this letter? In Romans 13, of that by those parents disobeying the law and disobeying civil authority, they were responsible for their children being taken from them. So you actually have politicians at times quoting the gospels or quoting the epistles to justify what they are doing. I have heard scripture quoted to justify the killing of human beings through execution. Religion is manipulated easily. And it's really important that you know about our Catholic faith, that you know what we really do believe and also understand that we're ever on the move and changing. We are ever on the move. It took 1500 years of dialogue with the people of the church, the church is the people of God, to come to a part where we changed the catechism in August, 2018, that under no conditions can human beings ever be executed by the state. That took 1500 years of experience and dialogue. We're now in a whole lot of dialogue going on in the church about gay and lesbian people being able to love and to have their unions blessed or not. You have huge tension going on. Whenever we're in movement and we're changing, there's gonna be tension. It used to be when the church upheld slavery. You had all these white plantation owners in Louisiana going to mass on Sunday and they're hearing from the pulpit, Father saying to them, slaves obey your masters at quoting the epistles of St. Paul, not resist your oppression. But then people begin to question and people begin to resist and gradually the change came. We are in the process of that. We're just going through it with the death penalty, but listen to the dialogue happening in the community right now, LGBTQ community. And I'm gonna just end with one thing. When Vatican II set out to reform the Catholic Church, to say to us, you gotta make faith live, which is gonna lead us to Pope Francis saying that we as believers need to be like the field hospital out near where the wounded are, wherever that little field hospital might be. It might be in a classroom, it might be on a campus with mental health. It defined us, the church as the people. That was huge because before, they always thought, it. well, that's the bishops, that's the priests, that's the nuns, that's the real church. We just are lowly lay people. Uh-uh. Everybody baptized in Christ, everybody called to live the gospel of Jesus to the full. Um, I would just like to follow up on that, Sister Helen. Thank you for sharing that as well. Um, how have you, it's like hard wording this, but like how just like in a general sense, how to move beyond the rigidity of belief and that there is constant change or like, how do we respond well to the experiences that jolt us out of our previous understandings? Yeah, and you know, it's always gonna be an ongoing thing. And you know, we are gonna fail as we do it. We do it imperfectly before we do it right. And that's part of the change too. I just draw a sketch of my friend, Danny LaBeouf and her little dog I'm not an artist, all right? But I got this book, How to Draw a Face. Yeah, this is a kick. So I start out, man, I drew something that no more looked like Danny LaBeouf and not even looked like the dog, it looked like a rat. But I just kept working at it. And now the face kind of appeared, she kind of resembles Danny and the dog, you know, appears more like Bailey. You stay at it. You know what, what's the opposite of faith? Is it doubt or is it certitude? Is the opposite of faith doubt or is it certitude? Can we have any kind of certitude in faith? What would certitude be based on? Have to be some kind of empirical proof, mathematical proof, certitude? It's always a leap. I mean, the whole thing of being a human being is the leap. We reach out, we try and fail, 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 fail. And then gradually that little sketch gradually appeared. You know, we stay at it. Even with the writing thing, because I love to 
read about writers. I'm a writer. And, and Auguste Flaubert, who wrote Madame Bovary, the first modern novel, you know how he defined talent. Anybody want to take a guess? Come on, take a shot. What's talent? Take a shot. What? Give a shot. What's talent? I want to hear from somebody. Oh, I'm not going to tell y'all the answer. <laughs> What's talent? Come on. Ed, it looked like you wanted to say something. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. I want to hear from you. I want somebody to take a shot at this. What do you think talent is? Oh, like natural talent? Is natural how talent. Like natural aptitude or something? Like natural aptitude. That's talent. Well, look, sure, she's a great basketball player. She's six foot four and she's got good coordination or or she's a genius with that that's talent she's born with it all she has to do is just do it Flaubert defined talent as a long patience <sighs> you get in there and you start and you care about it you're gonna get better at what you're doing it's not just this thing that just arrives full-blown and that's why I love that Louise Vincent used this thing of the seed so much. See the seed, that little potential curled up in there. You look at that little seed. You know that's going to be an oak tree? You look at that seed. Suppose nobody had ever seen the tree before. Look at this. See this? This is going to be an oak tree. Yeah, right. Who would believe that? Who can believe what a seed would do? The long patience. And that's God's spirit working in our hearts to steady us, to be able to keep at it. Whatever the original question was, I forgot. I went off on this thing of talent. <laughs> Somebody want to get us on track? Or maybe I didn't lose it. I don't know. Where are we? What's next? <laughs> no, no, you didn't lose anybody. But um, I, I think you did answer the question. Because the question was, like, how do we respond well to the experiences that jolt us out of our previous understandings? It's yeah, long I patience. I could have answered yeah. that a lot better, Mary. Can I try again? Yeah, you could try again. <laughs> Thank you. You know, you get better at it, like the sketch. Maybe I'll work up to it. Be patient. First of all, we have to recognize when something makes us uncomfortable. That can be a sure sign that the spirit stirring the pot with us. Something makes us uncomfortable. See, because as long as we're always at room temperature, everything is copacetic, we, you don't get change. You're not going to change. And that basically hit was what happened to me. I lived out in the suburbs, taught all white kids in a suburban school. But once I went into St. Thomas and African-American people became my teachers, everything was so blooming different. It was like a different country. And I was really uncomfortable. And so I just felt that what was asked of me was to learn. I am writing in my journal like you wouldn't believe when I was at Hope House and reading Lives of the Saints I'd never read before, like Martin Luther King, uh, to learn their life, to, to learn from them. So it's a moment where you're out, you're getting thrown out of your old mold, kind of like, you know, molting. Uh, you know, we have the, the crabs in the Gulf of Mexico and they go into the marshes when they molt and they leave their hard shell behind but they're very vulnerable in this. Sadly, that's how we get soft shell crabs in restaurants. But that's the sad part of that. But when we molt and when we're gonna leave something behind, it's because we're growing into something else. And we can't concentrate on the part of, oh, I'm leaving this behind, I'm leaving this behind, I'm leaving this behind. Like somebody marries somebody that they love and think, oh, I'm leaving my mom and daddy behind, I'm leaving my mom. They're not gonna make it to the honeymoon. If you keep thinking about what you're leaving and what you're losing, but now how is this calling me? The Dalai Lama is beautiful about this, that anything that happens to us in life and people that rub us the wrong way, people we don't like, what is this supposed to teach me? It's a deep Buddhist practice and we can have somebody maybe like Mary Jean or people that live out of this deeply who might want to share their wisdom on this. What is this teaching me? What am I supposed to learn from this? 
Was that better? Amira, I could try again. No, I think that was really good. <laughs> Thank you. I feel like I'm getting there doing the sketch. I'm going to show you all that sketch before we leave tonight because I'm kind of proud the way it's shaping up. Yeah, after, please do. After three months of sketching. <laughs> okay, where are we now? Yeah, Giselle, go ahead. Or did I get that wrong? Um, I'll go, but I just wanted to touch real quickly on something Sister Helen said about that leaning into the um, uncomfortability, that discomfort. I think to be able, and you talked about like the molting, to be able to like lean into that and really ask yourself, why is this making me uncomfortable? Why am I feeling this discomfort? And to be able to name that, I, I think it's such a level of vulnerability that I don't see many people tapping into nowadays. And, you know, it really stills within you th this sort of, you know, deep, I think, spiritual change. When you are able to ask that question and sit with yourself on that question, I, I think it really creates a, a growth within someone to lean into that discomfort of the experience and to be able to grow and, and to acknowledge that it is growth and that growth is uncomfortable and it's not supposed to be, you know, something that is fun and exciting. It's supposed to make you feel, you're supposed to feel that change, to go through that change and that transformation. I think it's such a, such a powerful experience that when you look back and you say, how was I ever like this? I, I, I can't believe that I used to think like that. I can't believe, you know, this is how I was. And you are able to look back and see that change and that growth and to be able to speak on it for others to see just how, how, um, how much, you know, that experience can change you, how, how much you can grow and help others through that experience. Yeah, but, well, thank you for that. I, I want to respond to, maybe somebody else wants to respond to this too. It's that feeling, it's not just uncomfortableness, but it's combined with, it's scary, but it's also exciting. I mean, it's like, you know, that it's a turning point, it's a pivot, and you, you feel both at the same time. I think something that makes a huge difference in us is community. How many times have you experienced a friend? You've been wanting to work out for 400 years. You keep telling yourself you want to walk. You want to go to the gym. You want to, and a friend says, come on, I go to the gym on Tuesdays. Come with me. Community brings us into things. I'm going to this meeting. Come with me. And they can help us. It's kind of like those little pace horses. When a, when a horse is training for the race and you have a little pace horse right by the little horse, you know, friends can be like that to us and get us involved in things as well to help us to take the first step. And then, of course, we have to do it on our own. Somebody else want to take a shot at that? Thank you for sharing that. Because uncomfortableness, see the call to change. I remember one time a psychiatrist, we was, I was working with young people in a parish. And of course, drugs were coming in. This was in the, in the 70s. And a lot of young people were really getting addicted all over the place. And so the parents, of course, concerned, how are we going to give our kids break from this? And, and the psychiatrist, he gave a talk, and I always remember it. And he said... Human beings don't like to change. We get set in our ways. It's familiar to us. We know what to do. We don't like to change. But the pain level has to rise high enough in us. It has to get something uncomfortable, something that happens where the pain level rises that we say will change. And he said the danger with drugs is when that pain level begins to rise in the person who's addicted, they take the drug and it lowers the pain level. And so you can stay stuck when there's any kind of addiction that just lowers it. Here, have a, have a beer, have three beers. You feeling stress? Have, whatever, if it's alcohol or whatever it is. Or addicted to the bloody TV. You know, your little shows you gotta watch, you stream this. You use spending hours of your time streaming stuff and not digging in with your mind or reading or whatever. It could be anything. But when the pain level gets high enough, then we change. 
it makes us uncomfortable enough that we got to do something. Like with health, we start putting on so many pounds, we need training wheels from a bicycle to help us to walk around a block. Well, then you know things are getting bad and you got to go on a bloom diet, right? Okay. Maybe somebody else. What else do we want to talk about? I have a question. Um, so the next question that we came up with for you was, um, have you ever felt like you wanted to stop doing the work? How do you cope with exhaustion? What sustains you to continue working for justice and peace? And what do you root yourself in to keep moving forward? We'd also love to gather wisdom from all of the audience. So um, if you all wouldn't mind just sharing in the chat anything that you do to sustain you as you work for justice and peace, um, we would love to hear from you all. Okay, and I'm gonna be short on purpose. And then it's just gonna be silent if you don't come in because we wanna hear from you because this is the sharing. I'll tell you one big thing is I keep visiting and going to the prisoners. I have a man on death row I'm accompanying. His name is Manuel Ortiz and he's innocent. And he's going on 29 years in this cell, in, in death row cell. And I'm there by his side and I'm there for him and I'm gonna see him through. He keeps me going. You think you're tired? What, somebody looked at you wrong, you got your feelings hurt, here is a man. And when and, and in the presence also of that man I was telling you about who did that unspeakable act and just got word actually that was dropped on him that he thought he had a chance of parole. He's been in prison 41 years and has a perfect record. He thought he had paid his dues to society and then found out and the DA dropped another life sentence on him for, because he did some terrible murders. So what keeps me going is first of all, staying close to what I do, staying close to it and doing it. I mean, look, COVID got me off the road. I spent my life on planes going to people to wake up the people. I know that's what I got to do because I've witnessed six executions. I know how this thing works. I know how it's broken. I know people are good. I know they don't think about this issue. It's my job. It's what I got to do. COVID takes me off the road and creativity through Zoom. I've been able to have encounters with 145 groups, more than if I had traveled even, because travel takes time. If I had a gig in Minneapolis, it, you, I'm talking about three days. You got to fly there, it's far away. You got to do the thing and you got to come home. Boom. I could Zoom at three places or even people in other countries. But to keep doing the work. And I do this. I have to do this. It's a moral imperative in me. It streams out of me. Was it, uh, we're not, I'm saying your name wrong, forgive me, who said it just flows out of you that it's what you got to do, right? Isn't that what you said? How you put it? The thing of being of service to others. Didn't you put it that way? And then it's coming out of your being, see? Otherwise, you have to do your willpower. I will do this. I think in the Tao, it's called non-action. It flows out of you. You're going to do it. It just flows out of you. And as we do it, it's just like a swimmer that gets good or a violin player that gets good or an artist that gets good it begins to flow out of us. And the community also keeps us going. I'm with lawyers and people who work with human rights uh, at Guantanamo with the, their clients being horribly tortured. And I'm in their company and they keep doing it. And it strengthens me as well. That's my take. Somebody else, what keeps you going? Um, I'll go first in terms of, you know, um, <laughs> like what keeps me going is like, I think what, um, Jess had said in the, uh, chat of like surrounding myself with like-minded individuals who encourage me and remind me that, you know, that it's, it's not just me who cares about this and that I'm not, you know, I'm not by myself in this, that, you know, ever, ever there's, 
people that I can turn to who also can turn to me that we are hand in hand in this fight. Yeah, um, that's big. That's really big. That's good. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? What keeps you going? Or maybe you're not going, maybe you quit. I think for me, um, what keeps me going is relationships, so friendships. Um, and something that I was really drawn to in your book um, is that quote that says, I want to care deeply for someone and hopefully have someone care deeply for me. And this idea of care and feeling care with others um, and being in relationship with others through like the hard moments and like the fun and joyful moments um, is what sustains me. I think someone in the chat talked about how, um, I think it was Minister Janae, yeah. Um, experiencing joy and laughter and play for like people who typically aren't given those opportunities. Um, just experiencing joy with other people is what keeps me going. It sustains me. Yeah, anybody else on that on the joy or playfulness? Playfulness. What's your play level like? Are you so serious? How do you play? I mean, playfulness is really important. Development of humor, like a garden. Developing humor. What's your favorite jokes? You ever share jokes? You invite other people to tell jokes? What's your humor like? Anybody want to do a take on that? What is your humor like? What makes you laugh? Or what do you find humorous? There's ways to develop this. I'll tell you my one sad, bad cartoon I just saw. You know what low self-esteem is? I might tell you what low very low self-esteem is. Now you got to picture this cartoon. So it shows a guy lying across a road and you see a car bump, you see the car is stopped there. And, it, and the saying under it is this, ever encumbered with low self-esteem, Bob gets a job as a speed bump. One way I don't like, Zoom is you can't hear people laugh. And I can see y'all's face. But now, did you find that humorous? Or was that sad for you? If you were a serious person, you know, oh, poor Bobby's the speed bump. Oh, God, that's terrible. I'm cracking up. I don't know about anybody else. <laughs> but dark humor is good to me. And that's funny. <laughs> I have a good friend, Sister Maria. And I tell her these jokes. She goes, oh, poor Bob. I go, oh. Anyway. But you have to develop playfulness, though. And just think for a moment about playfulness in your life. How is that expressed? Because you got to play with stuff. Anyway, jokes are just one way in that. But friendship, the development of friendship. Anybody want to talk about that? Relationships are everything. They're everything. If we're not related to people, we die. If we don't relate to animals, we die quicker. Look how how Obama and they're talking about their dog, Bo died. They had the dog for 10 years. He went through a lot of stuff with him and he died. Their dog died and they're grieving. And I mean, look at how animals bring us joy, that connectedness. I put a bird feed out here when a COVID thing shut me down, brought me home. I can't tell you the joy when those birds come. A few little things about the joy about a bird feeder. I know you probably didn't plan for this, but I want to inject it. I put the bird feed out. Birds are free. They come to your feeder, they don't. And when they come, it's a free gift. So when the Cardinal and his wife comes, Mr. Cardinal and his wife comes, I know they got babies nearby and I'm feeding them, man. They're gonna have so many babies because what they appear and then they fly away and it's a joy because I put the food out there for them and they responded. That's a little connection. Or even have a goldfish. You ever had a goldfish? <laughs> Fish, animals, a cat. Cats are wonderful. I had a parakeet, Billy Boy. He, he could say half to Hail Mary. He was a Catholic parakeet. And I was the only one in the family that could teach him to talk. I mean, it was great because I also taught him other things and he'd mix it up. The family be at supper and there goes Par there goes Billy Boy in his cage going, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with praise on, Lord is with praise on. 
Drop dead, stupid. Hi, ho, silver. We connected. And I'm going to tell you, when I left for the convent, this is in the days when you went to be a nun, you were leaving everything. You were never going to go inside your parents' house again. I described this in River of Fire about leaving home. It was a radical step. I was doing all right. You know, mama had sewed all my nun clothes. Everything has to be white or black. The pajamas, what? no black pajamas, but white anyway. Trunks packed. It's in the back of the station wagon. It's on the birthday of the Blessed Mother, giving my life over to God. Mama's fixed the last meal. Sound like I'm on death row. But we, a meal I really enjoyed before I joined the convent. We're going to get in the car to drive to New Orleans where the novitia was. And mama has to go and say to me, did you feed Billy boy? And we had one of those chest deep freezes in the kitchen and Billy boy did me in. And I leaned over that and I just started crying and I couldn't stop. And I got in a car, sat between mom and daddy and cried all the way to New Orleans because I was leaving this home that I loved to go and be a nun, to be a bride of Christ, and boy, the journey began. <laughs> I put it in River of Fire, but the daggone little parakeet is what did me in. So I went, oh, Billy boy, he's going to teach him how to talk. His vocabulary is going to go dead. And he had a bristling vocabulary. Sister Helen, uh, do you have any questions for us, uh, for the panelists? Oh, yeah. Do I get to ask questions, too? Does it, it, I want to ask them of the panelists, but is anybody else out there with a question too that you want to ask? Because so this is sharing, y'all. This is the way it works. Are you just receiving? Or are you going to put in a little something into the pot too? Anybody else? I'll it's just say really quickly. Yeah, go ahead. <clears throat> the one one way that I loved doing service with teenagers was to put them in improvisational work. And it starts being goofy because you do pass a clap. <laughs> the, everyone in the world will start laughing because they can't do it. Yes, yes. It's yes. great. So yes, laughter is important for building community. Yes, it worked it wherever I went. So yeah, wow. And I can't go those places because of COVID. Yeah, so, right. That's really yeah. gonna down them in. You know, anyway. All the artists, all the improv. Improv is so great. I yep. mean, why, for, why do charades have such a long run? Not that anybody, I don't know if anybody, anybody ever do charades anymore. Mm. There you go. So, okay. That's improv, pure improv. So let's see, what question do I want to ask you? Um, there's this person teaching a course at Yale right now called the Social... Um, the science of well-being or happiness course. And I'm, I'm sorry, I'm vague on her name, but when she taught the first semester of it, they put her in the biggest auditorium they had at Yale because so many students, it's called a happiness course, how to be a happy person, how to be whole. And that intrigued me. And so I guess I'd want to ask you, what makes you happy? When are you happiest? What makes you happy? Helen, in Buddhism, ha true happiness is knowing that you can overcome any obstacle in life. What do you mean by overcome? Face it and be victorious, whatever that victory looks like. When I was, uh, when I was, my liver was failing and I needed to have a transplant, uh, liver and kidney. And I was praying, I was telling the universe how this was all gonna work out. <laughs> that didn't work. Uh, and I, I changed my prayer to be, um, I will have, I will be a hundred percent victorious, no matter what that victory looks like. So I could die or I could get a, it didn't matter. And 
That to me is happiness. That's so interesting. And Ed, what do you mean by victorious? It means that um, you have found peace after struggling. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the struggle is important. Okay, great. This is a great start for what makes you happy. So overcoming a liver transplant, it makes you happy. No, but I mean, anything else on this? What gives you joy or what makes you happy? I got I got the liver, so I was happy. <laughs> you got delivered. I mean, that's yes. great. No, that's wonderful. Liver and kidney. That's wonderful. I think for me, um, uh, I find a lot of happiness and humor, just like you, Sister Helen. Um, so being able to bring humor to any space um, is always fun. And I love like enjoying other people's jokes. Yeah. Uh, people are just so funny and they're such a like joy to be around. And I think it's this idea that like everyone is worth getting to know. And so getting to know people, I think is my source of happiness. Wow, that's great. I'd have to put that up there in mind too. Anybody else, what makes you happy? I know similar to that and touching on um, that previous question of what keeps you going, I think connection of people like really brings me happiness. Like sometimes you just meet people that you just connect with that you, for no reason, people that you probably will never see again in your entire life. And you will sit down and they will tell you their life story and they'll give you advice and you'll just share in that moment where you're not worried about the time going, you, you're not worried about where you have to go. Those little moments of bliss where you can just enjoy being human, enjoy mm -hmm. being on this earth with someone else, I think really brings me a lot of happiness. And you know, like, wow, there are like billions of people on this earth and I get the chance to connect with this person and That's hear their great. story. Such a miracle, that is great, that is great. And then I, I really agree and resonate with you. Um, connection makes me happy. And so it doesn't have to be a joke. Um, there are people on this call who have cried with me and cried, cried tears that came from deep down inside. And that is, it's happiness too. It's connecting with a soul. Mm -hmm. Having a soul hear your speak and responding, that's happiness um, for me. That's good. That's so true. Somebody else. Question, anything intellectual make you happy? I'm never the same after I have conversations with Suzanne Dumbleton. She's always looking into stuff. You know, There's these courses at Newberry Library, Joan of Arc, man, she's digging into Joan of Arc, got the archives of her trial, man. I always walk away from her knowing more than I knew before. I love to, anything on intellectual joy, we are now opening up to intellectual joy. Let me, uh, Helen, well, since you since you turned. It's it, I'm you brought you in, Susan. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's, other people may know this as well, but if, if you get the opportunity to go to the Vincentian Center in Paris and you see the section on Louise de Marianne, the Lumiere is actually a physical object. So um, it represents a moment. She had such great doubt about what she was gonna do. She had real family difficulties. Her son was suffering. She had lost her husband. She, she, she thought she knew what she was going to do, but she wasn't sure. And she, had, she prayed and then she had a moment, you know, this moment of illumination we were talking about before. But what she did was she went back to her room and she wrote it on a piece of paper and she put it in her pocket. And when she died, I think uh, like 60 years later, they found it in her pocket that every day she took that reminder of the despair she had been in and the realization of the hopefulness that she was going toward. And she put it in her pocket because every day it's possible to bump into something that's going to throw you into the yeah. pits. And so yeah. she could just reach into her pocket and say, um, there's, there's this possibility. 
and I guess it's a little like it. I'm going to work through this. Um, mm -hmm. And so the illumination was a was a lifelong recognition of the of her call, and it was her moment. Right. And you know the thing is too, it's never done. Yeah. Do it. Right. But right. that river's always moving. Mm -hmm. So right. in the in the in the exhibition space is that piece of paper. Wow. It just kills me. I mean, you know, who else did that was Blaise Pascal at this moment of encountering God. What I wrote that in, um, in I think in Dead Man Walking. It, it's like, it lasted like from 10 at night to 12. And he just says, fire, not the God of the philosophers, but the God of Abraham, Isaac. And he wrote it down and he sewed it in his coat that when he died, they found it in the lining. Of course, I don't know how he read it in his coat. I guess he had to just know it was in his coat. This is, you may have thoughts about this. At any rate, when something really happens to you. In my journals, you know, I've kept journals uh, since a long time. And the kind of stuff that goes in my journals is, is gonna be um, sometimes a moment of awakening of something I realize I need to do. It's not always, what I need to do, but just understanding it. And I'll put in my journal like this big old flare, I'll draw big old flare uh, that boom, this happened. This is something I know I got to do, a deep conviction that doesn't go away. And that's a sure sign, you know, Ignatius of Loyola and discerning where God's spirit is moving in us, or it might be another spirit is where suddenly we have the illumination this is what I must do. But the sign that it's really from God is that it takes, you keep doing it. You're committed to it. Like I thought I was gonna play the guitar. I thought I was gonna have piano, learn to play the piano, but it was only because my sister was taking the piano lessons and I was jealous because grandma had said, Mary Ann can really play the piano. So I, mama, I want to I wanted play the piano. After I went to the second lesson, I realized I'd made a big mistake, but mama made me stick at it. At the recital, it's the first time I failed publicly, miserably. I didn't want to play the piano. I was only doing the piano. So you look and see what sticks, what's really deep inside you, and you keep doing it. And when, that when we have deep convictions about stuff and then a commitment grows, we realize that it's really deep with us. And we praise Jesus and give thanks that something finally took in our mercurial selves. I don't know what track we on now. Are we on happy news. Morgan has a question. Morgan. Morgan, Morgan yep. so good to see you. Oh, good to see you too, Sister Helen. Lovely to share some space with you, even if it's in Zoom. It's fantastic to, to be enlightened and inspired by you and our students um, this evening. And I wanted to kind of, um, I was really, uh, appreciative of uh, Giselle who who really shared her waking up moment um, at DePaul and how yours occurred here at DePaul and I was curious about the other student panelists um, and to, to share whether or not DePaul the DePaul community has challenged or and or supported your waking up moments um, is this a, a good environment to foster? What can we as faculty and staff who are present in this space with you, what um, are some feedback, some comments, some, because I've been really taking a lot of notes from the students here as, as a members of my community, um, you know, inspired by you, Sister Helen, your lessons of, of working with your community, being challenged by your community, um, the, all that you shared. So I'd, I'd love to hear a little bit more from, a, from the three student panelists and uh, or two students panelists in response to Giselle and, and how she really spoke to DePaul waking her up. And it doesn't need to always be a support thing, but challenged, you know, just more for us who are here to support you um, and or challenge or learn from you. We're all learning through this experience. So thank you. Now, don't feel under pressure to say nice things about DePaul. Y'all could be honest. What's it like for you? Or what, or what do you wish was better? Um, I'll go first. I see I'm um, thinking. I think for me, um, 
with the paw like okay you may not probably pick this up but I'm a very shy and introverted person like I don't like being vulnerable and open up to people at all um and I think that is something that I have struggled with when it comes to you know not just my classes but my my work my job and being afraid to kind of see the success that I have done and you know people always tell me oh you're doing such a great job but I myself can see and within this past year um you know a lot of things have happened a lot of shake up you know COVID coming back home and I I am so grateful for my supervisors at my, at my job um Minister Janae um Katrina Wagner in the office of HBW I think uh, the way that they have just expressed their support and their love has has really been so warm for me where you know I've you've heard you know professors you've heard people saying oh yes you can come you can talk to us anytime but I don't believe that at face value because I know sometimes you know people have to say it but I feel like in the community that I'm in at the Paul just the honesty, I think, and it's not just like repeating something like verbatim. For me, it has been the honesty, the emotion and the passion behind those words that have really um, caused me to like open up more with them and to really see the, the care and the passion that they have um, for the work that they do and for um, me as a student employee, as a, as a student at the Paul. And that is not something that I have picked up a lot on with like other people at the poll. A lot of the times, you know, you interact with people. And to me, I, I don't know if it's just my perspective, but sometimes it comes off as very superficial. And I think unless you're put into spaces where you can see the authenticity, yes, the authenticity and the passion, that's when you truly believe it, which is why I I, I try to be as authentic and I'm passionate when I'm speaking with others too. And I know sometimes I can come off as very monotone, but I try, especially when I make, you know, that connection that I talked about with, you know, um, other students, that connection with um, even others, faculty and staff. When I see that there is that connection, when I, I, I try to give my authentic self to them and try and let them see that authenticity within me so they know that this is a safe space um, because, you know, over, I, I don't know how I would have gotten through this past year if it wasn't for that open to see that passion, that support that I received and knowing that even if I may not want to, you know, talk about everything that has happened, but I know that I have that safe space for me, knowing that I have that safe space, no matter what is, is something that, you know, I, I, I wish I would have happened. I, I wish I would have gotten in my first year because my first year was a train wreck. It was, it was very much culture shock. It was very much adjusting. It was very much feeling like an outsider and, and not knowing where to turn and who to turn to. And, and to be able to have that now, like I'm almost sad that I have it in like my third year, like virtually, and I didn't get to experience that in person. And I, I think for me, that was like a big wake up call, just seeing the potential and, and that love and that joy. And, you know, with things being, this is just a whole long run, sorry, but with things being in person and next year, I'm hoping that with, you know, people that probably didn't get to experience that kind of um, community and environment with being virtual or people who just, I, I hope that with things being in person, that I will be able to provide that kind of wake up and warmth for others. But, you know, thank you. Yeah. Else. Um, I, I'll try to I'll try my best to keep it short and sweet. But I I've noticed that sometimes while I've met some people who are just absolute gems of a human being within the DePaul community, um, I've noticed that sometimes folks will walk, will talk the talk but not walk the walk of saying that they support these things, they do these things, they are actively doing such and such, but when looking at what they're doing critically, it's not providing community support, it's not 
actively being anti-racist in a classroom setting. It's not, you know, creating a curriculum that's that is based on compassionate learning and accessibility. It's it, it's really hard um, sometimes for for that for that base understanding to be there because if I don't see that a professor is bridging that gap then I don't feel very comfortable being in that space mm -hmm. um this is coming up a lot recently just because of some of the work that I'm doing so that's why <laughs> most of it has come back to a classroom setting um but it, it it's 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 really true it's if if I if we're showing if if we show tolerance in a classroom setting for a person's racist thoughts and racist opinions like yeah how am I supposed to exist in that space with them? Because now that space is inaccessible to me. Now I can't learn in that classroom. Um, so yeah, so I will be <laughs> moving on. So um, in preparing for this conversation, we found some wisdom that Louise de Meritlac wrote to Vincent de Paul. It is a good reminder for all of us and may have been her response to our earlier question about sustaining ourselves for the long haul. Uh, Louise shares, in the name of our Lord, Monsieur, do all you can to regain your health and take good care of it so that you can serve God and the poor for a longer time. Indeed, we hope and pray that all of you will take good care of your mind, body, and spirit to continue to be such an inspiration for many years to come. As we close, we would like to ask Sister Helen to give us a blessing to send us forth on our journeys of justice. I will bless you, but I also ask you to bless me. And I remember being with the women on death row in California. They were all behind these bars and we could visit with them. We were religious leaders standing there. We had all come in a group and they were all there. And before we left, we asked them to bless us. The, to bless really means like if you bless a crop of wheat or that the, the hope and the prayer is that it will come to fruition. And so my blessing for you is that this seed that you are, this potential with an infinite capacity to know truth and to love others may come to fruition, step by step, day by day, and that you will be attentive to that growth and be alert to when you get stuck and trust that the spirit of God in your heart can move you out of it to keep growing. And how blessed we are, as Jesus said to a group of people who were with him that day, blessed are your eyes that see what you see and ears that hear what you hear. And blessed are we who could be together in community today. You are a great gift to me. You made my day to day. And thank you so much for your sharing. I treasure. Thank you for Joanna and whoever else worked to, to make this happen today. The students, the panel, fantastic. So keep growing. Can I show you my, my drawing? Before I leave, can I show you my drawing? While she's getting her drawing, um, we'll just share a couple of quick announcements. If there's any students who are, there's many students here. Uh, if you fill out the link that was just put in the chat, we wanna send you some Louise goodies. So be sure to fill out that link so that you could get, perhaps you'll get a Louise cookie in the mail or some other good things to celebrate her. I'm just making a quick announcement and then we wanna see your drawing, Sister Helen. Um, okay. And also just a reminder, there's a lot of other Louise events that are happening this week. We'll put in the chat the blog post that has all of those events that you can check out along with you can follow us at Meet Me at the Mission. Um, so we're going to see the beautiful drawing and then Minister Janae is going to close us out with one um, final thank you for this. Okay. Let's see this picture. I, I do want to do a shout out to Georgie who makes a lot of all these good things happen in your wonderful student engagement. All right, y'all, I hope you can see it. Now, this is the real person. Can you kind of see her? Yeah. Okay, and then that's Bailey. Mm -hmm. All right, y'all can see her. Now, it's not supposed to be perfect, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's it's really that's good. Ah, I can see it. Yeah, it's coming together. Nice. 
It's awesome. Good where's job. your Where's your first Where's your first one? The one from three months ago. Oh wait, yeah, I'm gonna show you that. That's terrible. <laughs> that's the That's the lesson, Sister Helen, is to show us the growth and the stick with itness. I couldn't get her nose. Nose is a heart, but then I got this book, How to Draw Faces. It teaches you what to do with a nose. The lines are great now. Well, this is her too. Yeah. The hair is easy, man. Yeah, the hair is easy. Yeah, hair is easy. You can take her. But anyway. Yeah, yeah. You, you can uh -huh. see the, the progression. That's awesome. Yeah. 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 Anyway. So God bless the feed. God bless the feed. <laughs> okay. Oh, now, who comes next to end us? Thank you, everybody. This has been a complete joy for me. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Sister Helen. Thank you to every single person who is here this evening. Um, we want to thank you so much for not just being present, but asking questions and enjoying each other in the chat. Um, we know that it's hard not being able to be physically with each other in a room, but we know that this is still what community looks like, that we can still make those meaningful connections as we've done tonight. We invite all of you all to just thank our panelists and Sister Helen in the chat, maybe say a word of gratitude, maybe something you're taking with you and see that Joanna is offering deepest gratitudes with a beautiful virtual bouquet, letting you know how much we are thankful to the divine gods and spirits we all look up to for guidance, for blessing us with your presence and your wisdom. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful evening. Be safe. Take care of each other. Take care of yourselves. And if there's anyone out there who needs something and you don't have it, and you feel like you heard something about one of us this evening who might be able to help you, let us know. Um, we would love, I, it would be my deepest honor. I know it would be Georgie and Joanna's deepest honors to support you. There's some other DMM folks and some folks around the university. So if you need something and the only person you remember is the beautiful woman with the flowers and the curly hair, beautiful woman with the orange lips, you can hit up me and Joanna and we will get you <laughs> what you need. We want you all to know that you're not alone um, as very evidenced by this large group of people here. So. Good night. Rest well. Thank you for being here. Thank you.